Hey everybody, I'm just uh, posting that I'm about to draw to my social media, and I'll be right with you. Uh, today's Inktober prompt is uh, ship. I couldn't think of anything too original, so um, it made me think of Shipwreck, one of my favorite G.I. Joe characters. I'm going to try to draw Shipwreck. Uh, I've been sketching out a sort of a pose of him sort of jumping through some glass, could sort of be tilted like that not sure hello Charles welcome so uh, yeah that's what I'm thinking I'll uh, keep drawing um, today all right so I posted the links let's have some little caffeine hello ghost dog hmm oh that's good that's the stuff <clears throat> hello Keith Thomas Okay, I'm caffeinated. Uh, the question is, where should I start on something like this? Well, I think I'm actually going to start with uh, some of the glass, because it's, it's basically in the foreground. So we'll see how that goes. So, hump day, right? How's it going for everybody? Hope it's going well. Hope you're feeling good. <clears throat> Hello, Geek Workshop. Uh, good. Glad to hear hear that. That's uh, that's positive. Need more positive uh, things. So, yeah. Uh, the episode I am creating this week is it's very ambitious, just in terms of the scope involved. So, uh, I've been working on it. Uh, for several hours every day this week, and it's uh, it's quite tricky to to guess exactly where it's going to end up. I, I hope I can sort of rein things in a little and make it uh, clear. So anyway, I've got a really committed myself to this week's episode. I want it to be something special. I want them all to be special. Uh, some of them are easier than others. If I find a a really silly comic to review and I'm basically just sort of reading it and inserting my unique brand of <laughs> comedic stylings over that well that's definitely an easier approach than um, when I'm sort of researching a specific creator and trying to uh, address what I consider the salient points of uh, their career. So, yeah, it's a busy week for comic tropes. Um, and, you know, I don't want the episodes to necessarily be overly long, but they're going to be whatever length they're going to be. Um, I think that people that get more views on their uh, material than I do probably have that kind of consideration of, oh, when does the audience start losing interest and tuning out? I don't have that big an audience, all things considered, so I just make the episodes as long as I feel like making them. Um, you know, I mean, I might as well have fun. That, that's sort of my thinking, anyway. Um, I'm not really making much money off of them or anything, so I might as well be sort of uh, doing what's fun for me. Let's see, um, Keith Thomas says, post Inktober idea, do
do a show where you complete to your satisfaction some of this month's drawings. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Um, because I've sort of imposed certain uh, pretty arbitrary rules when you think about it to myself in terms of um, Inktober. I'm like, okay, let's see what I can do in an hour. Let's focus on the technique rather than necessarily the finished product. That said, sometimes a drawing is going really well and I want it to sort of meet my expectations and it, and it can be hard to uh, sort of let it go or realize that it isn't going the way that I want and that I'd need to spend more time on it to, to get it to that position. It's an interesting idea. Maybe I just start with a fresh drawing, but I still like your suggestion. <clears throat> so, probably just about done with this idea. I just wanted to lay in a few big shapes. Uh, and then go from there. Um, Ghost Dog says, what am I inking? Uh, well, these are basically going to be glass shards, specifically. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of have this character be jumping through a window more or less. So, um, that's not necessarily the important part of this. The, the figure is the important part, but I just wanted it to sort of uh, make sense to me as I'm drawing it, like where some of these shapes are coming. And uh, I said at the top, like, you know, the, the, um, the prompt word was ship. So I'm drawing shipwreck. Not the most original possibly, but... Um, it's just what I felt like drawing. Uh, hello to Aldi and TARDIS Rider. Nice to have both of you along. Um, where did I put my... There, go. Brush. Uh, what's he drawing? Can't quite tell. Well, it'll probably become uh, more obvious uh, as, I, as I especially work on the face. So let me, um, let me hop up here for a minute. And... Uh, Try to work on this cap, because that's a pretty big identifier for this character. And uh, once I've got the cap and the face laid in, it might uh, might be a little more clear who I'm who I'm working on. We'll see. Field Brown joins us, Software Agents Corp. Nice to see everybody. Uh, Software Agents Corp said that he thought it was the T-1000 being shattered towards the end of Terminator 2. Oh, well, fair enough. Uh, Sega Migs joins us, and TARDIS Rider says it's Gilligan. <laughs> he wears Gilligan's cap, so that's fair. Um, this is just a, a, a G.I. Joe character I, I happen to like, uh, Shipwreck. Uh, Uh, the only important thing you need to know is that he's a sailor. Uh, the word was ship. That was the prompt word for today. I didn't really have any good original ideas, but uh, I decided shipwreck would uh, would suit me for today. <clears throat> so. Let him slowly take shape here. Uh, 
Plus, I'd done so many vehicles lately, I was like, well, I could do, do an actual ship, but uh, they've already sort of seen me draw ships. I've or Not ships, but vehicles, and I feel like I've been doing a bunch of vehicles lately, so let's uh, let's see what else can come up with based on that idea. I was in the mood to draw a person again and specifically just somebody in a like an action -y pose. So got him dual wielding pistols like he's Chow Yun Fat. Who I don't see in movies nearly enough. God damn, is he cool. I miss 90s Chow Yun Fat big time. So many good movies. Uh, okay, some questions. Uh, Ollie says, never read a G.I. Joe comic, and I don't think I missed much. Oh, uh, I, I would argue maybe you did. Uh, I think that the, uh, the original G.I. Joe comic from the... Uh, 80s Marvel uh, holds up pretty well a lot of it like at least its first maybe uh, mm, 70 or so issues I think it's pretty good stuff I mean yeah it's licensed and it's hawking a, a toy but uh, I think that Larry Hama the writer of it had some really creative ideas and uh, he's always been a pretty good comic book writer and uh, yeah, I, I like it. I, I definitely would say that there's a lot of really cool arcs uh, in in that uh, comic. Um, you know, maybe it isn't uh, everyone's bag what they're, uh, you know, a military sort of organization versus a terrorist. I mean, it's basically S.H.I.E.L.D., Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., whatever you want to call it. It, 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 it was designed to be. Um, but... Uh, I like it. Then again, I mean, I, I'm aware that there's a uh, nostalgia factor mixed in there, too. This is what I grew up with, so that kind of makes it cool to me. But I think it was actually, uh, you know, for being a, um, a toy line, I think that the comic book is quite strong. Uh, Keith Thomas, uh, oh, let's see, some other people joining us, CSNG, Mike L, Anja, uh, comic book guy, hello all. That's that's awesome. Wow. Um, he says, any tips on shading shadows? Um, I mean, for, for shadows, you have to just keep studying real life and, uh, and seeing where the, where the light falls. There, there's nothing else you can do for shortcuts there. You have to just become familiar with, with how that works. Um, for shading, that just starts to become something you, you, I think, learn with practice because there's lots of different ways to um, represent that. You know, it depends on whether you're going for like a really hard uh, chiaroscuro style or if you just want to uh, keep the line work nice and open and just have a little bit of feathering and cross hatching here and there. Um, and some of that will maybe depend on how much you're using a colorist to aid you. So, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that, that probably isn't super helpful, but like lighting and, and shading is, is just something that comes with practice and uh, and looking at real life and eventually you're like yeah to me this looks right because it's really all cheating um, all we're doing is putting lines on a piece of paper like you know shadows aren't pure black and there's no outline on people that's not a thing that happens like if I have my hand here there's no black outline to indicate that this is a hand so we're, we're, we're sort of working with some weird cheating techniques to, to imply uh, something real rather than actually representing something real.
pretty weird if you think about it. All right, got a good amount of the face blocked in now, and uh, hopefully that uh, makes it a little more clear uh, if you know the character, and if you don't, hopefully you can at least tell that he's supposed to be a sailor. Uh, Geek Workshop says, should I start watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. again? I never got past the first couple episodes. Uh, if you didn't like those, uh, I would probably skip uh, all the way until Season 4 and try it out then. Because I think that Season 4 um, is a pretty big improvement and, and changes things up. Um, but you'll probably know within a few episodes of that season whether it's for you or not. Uh, TARDIS Rider says, I've never been a G.I. Joe fan, but there was a really well-done issue with no dialogue. It was well done. Yeah, um, something like issue 26 or 27. It was pretty early on. Um, the, the, the silent issue... Uh, where Snake Eyes rescues Scarlet from uh, Destro's castle. It was uh, it was really cool, especially when it came out. It was just so different, you know. I'd never really read anything like that in, in a comic before, so uh, I like that. But that's why I think the comic, even though it was um, based on a toy line, it, it, it still took a, some chances and had some cr creativity to it. Um, it wasn't, wasn't all about just introduce this character, introduce that character. Like, unfortunately, I was, as a kid, more into the Transformers toys, but the Transformers comic book wasn't very good because all it was was purely to introduce the, ne the next toy and the next toy and the next toy. It, there was, yeah, it wasn't that good. I missed a few things, sorry. Uh, if it's better than NFL Super Pro, maybe I will give G.I. George. It's much better than NFL Super Pro. Uh, okay, I'm trying to make sense of this. Let's see. Mike says, my first comment didn't send, I guess. I was saying, I like to, at a game, when reading comics, where did they screw up? It, it says nothing bad about the artist at all. In fact, it says... A lot about how well they can fix things without an eraser. Another thing I like to do, and this only works with older comics as well, is trying to figure out if it was the pencils or the inks that made a certain decision. Okay. Um, sounds fun. I, I didn't follow it 100%, but yeah. Uh, Superman blows up Congress. <laughs> it says, Chris, what are your favorite Superman stories? Um, uh, All-Star Superman by uh, um, Morrison and Quitely. Uh, Fantastic. Um, I like the Man of Steel miniseries by John Byrne. 
I like whatever happened to the man from tomorrow, the man of tomorrow. Yeah, whatever happened to the man of tomorrow. Um, and also, uh, what do you get for the man who has everything? I think is the name of the title. Anyway, those those were two stories written by uh, Alan Moore for for uh, Superman. Um, one was like the final Superman story before Crisis rebooted everything, and another <coughs> is a story where Mongol uh, infects him with a plant that makes him live like sort of his utopian dream existence. Um, so, uh, yeah, so th those are all some Superman stories that I like quite a bit. Um, yeah. Jake Terlecki says, marketing ploy to sell toys reminds me of the original Secret Wars issue. Well, that's true. Yeah, that was to sell toys, too. Would you recommend the old Star Wars comic books from the 80s? Um, I'll say this. Uh, there are several issues that Walt Simonson drew that have good art. And reading the ones that adapt the movies is just interesting to see sort of a alternate take where they didn't have as much reference material to go on. Uh, it doesn't really feel like Star Wars for the most part. So so it's 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 hard to recommend, you know? I mean, as a kid it was like we took it cuz that was all we could get. But if I'm looking at it like with a more critical eye, it didn't really feel like Star Wars, so it's not that great. I'd say only as sort of a curiosity or like sort of like if you're just curious what what was being done at the time, but don't expect good stories per se. I, I in fact I I would say most of them are pretty bad the stories. Nintendo just made it, and uh, Chrissy also joined and says, I'm late. Are you drawing Popeye the Sailor Man? Uh, in a way. In a way, I am. Uh, Shipwreck is, was a G.I. Joe that uh, sort of said the same things that Popeye would say it, but would like be read by Jack Nicholson. He'd always be going like, I'll save my bones for Davy Jones. Things like that. It's pretty great. Pretty great. Pretty, pretty, pretty great. Anyway, all that's important for today is that I'm uh, drawing a gentleman who's jumping through a window, guns at the ready. I like the second live-action G.I. Joe film. I like Blind Master and Jinx. Who are your fave Joes, and what do you think of the 80s animated film? That's all from Comic Book Guy. Um, my favorite G.I. Joes are Snake Eyes for sure, um, Shipwreck, Stalker, Roadblock. Uh, for Cobras, I, I always liked Zartan. Uh, Cobra Commander, I actually get a huge kick out of. Um, the Vipers, I think, had an awesome design. Um, I like a little bit more the grounded, sort of non-sci-fi stuff, but uh, 
Yeah, I liked G.I. Joe quite a bit, and um, the 80s movie is its not very good. <laughs> but I kind of, I, there's a big part of me that likes it for nostalgia's sake. Uh, hard to describe, I guess. Ever read Rassel by Jeff, Jeff Smith, asks Keith Thomas. I have. Yeah, that, that's great. I'm a big fan of Jeff Smith. I thought that Rassel was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was a cool comic, for sure. Recommended. I mean, if you can only read one thing by Jeff Smith, read Bone. But if you like his artwork and want to see some more sort of trippy ideas, uh, Rassel is, uh, is worth reading. Good question. Good, uh, good book. Speaking of Grant Morrison, what's your favorite JLA story? Mm. I don't know. I guess the one against the uh, White Martians. Yeah. That was pretty good. Mike says something about, I guess no one else sees that, but I'm not sure what he's talking about, unfortunately. Uh, Software Agents Corp says, I like The Rock as Roadblock in G.I. Joe Retaliation. Not sure how accurate he was to the character. Um, probably not overly accurate. It wasn't like he did anything that was inaccurate. It was just that they, uh, kind of dropped a bunch of what makes Roadblock unique, which is that he likes, uh, cooking a lot. Uh, he sort of has interests outside of the military and, uh, has a real life and, uh, but, you know. They were trying to tell a movie, and I guess there was no room for that. Too bad. <clears throat> the 80s movie has one of the best openings I've ever seen. Yeah, the opening to, to the um, animated movie is fantastic. I think that then what I read was that like they'd finished the movie and they realized that there really wasn't an action scene for quite a long time. So they went back and they, uh, they made that whole opening to sort of help compensate for that because it, it does take a while for the, for the movie to get going. That was sort of their way of compensating. If that's true. I think it makes sense. Mike says, a lot of times, instead of erasing, artists make their mistakes part of the drawing. It's hard to believe nobody sees that. Oh, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's, that's a fair statement. That's true. I think it's less accurate these days, though, because it's much easier now to digitally correct something. Uh, before, you had to deal with either whiteout or a patch. Uh, these days, you can sort of... Just fix that part digitally. So, yeah, different, different time. Uh, Hello, Nino joins, and hello to you. Thank you for joining. Um, Frank Miller had said somewhere that one of his art theories in recent years, make of that what you will. Oh, just sort of the incorporating mistakes into the final, final piece. Is that it?
Sorry, I'm uh, realizing that I'm sort of getting lost in my own thoughts a little bit. I'll uh, see what else is going on in the chat room in just a sec. Um, what are some comics you are hoping get a film adaptation? Interesting. Um, I think We Three would make an interesting adaptation. Uh, I would love to see a film adaptation of Bone, animated, but like you know, theatrical release, big budget. Bone would be really cool. Um, I would like to see a TV adaptation of Why the Last Man. I don't think film would do a good job there. So those are a few that would be up there. Uh, Hello Nano says, do you pre-plan what you are drawing this month or think it up on the day? I, I, on the day, usually just like about an hour before uh, we go live, I uh, look at what the prompt is for that day and uh, see what sort of pops into my head, start sketching out something loose that I can uh, ink. And uh, go from there. Okay, Mike says he's going to be back, but his phone died. Okay, uh, comic book guy says in the 80s film, they blame Cobra Commander for everything, but he's a scientist, not a soldier, and if Serpentor is made of great military leaders, yet did nothing, but say, this is this I command. Cobra Commander was surrounded by fools. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're definitely not supposed to uh, think about it too much, because Cobra was kind of insane. It, it's, it's weird that they presented such an ongoing threat and had such military might. I mean, they had crazy ideas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can't think about it too much, I guess. Uh, maybe it's an American thing with G.I. Joe, but here in Europe, it never really caught on. Um, yeah, it was definitely super American at a time when everything here was overly patriotic, uh, kind of a crazy way. So uh, They tried it as action force over there for a long time, but uh, I know that it was never as popular as uh, it was over here. But throughout the 80s, it was uh, ridiculously popular over here.
Software Agents course says, I never followed G.I. Joe remotely until that excellent Renegades show came out. What are some of the crazier Cobra ideas from the 80s cartoon? Uh, they had Zartan form a band, a, a hair metal band called Cold Slither, designed to hypnotize people. Um, what else? Destro was always inventing crazy sci-fi stuff like a weather dominator. Um, uh, one time Cobra invented shrinking technology, so they uh, disguised themselves as toy donations for charity that G.I. Joe brought onto their base, and then Cobra expanded to full size. One time G.I. Joe and Cobra were having a uh, military battle uh, over near Greece and some aliens came out of nowhere and uh, accidentally transported them all to ancient Greece. That was weird. Hollow <laughs> uh, Nano says it'd be really cool if Blue Sky made a bone movie with the animation style of the Peanuts movie. I heard that that was uh, well animated, but I actually didn't say it, so I uh, don't have a strong opinion on that, but uh, yeah, it would be nice if a, a big studio would take on Bone. Uh, I think a lot of people would love it. What kind of ink pens do you use? Does it matter? Um, it doesn't matter too much. Um, I have been using several different things. Uh, what I'm using, like a technical pen for like fine details, I'm, I tend to use this Pigma Micron. I'll do a lot of the um, sort of outlining and thicker areas with brush pens, like these uh, Pigma Fine or Pigma Mediums. And if I add more time, uh, because it's a slower process, um, but I use um, an actual brush and, and ink, um, I'll show you. It, it ultimately kind of all produces a relatively similar looking uh, thing, but uh, the, the, this gives you a little more control and, uh, and a deeper black. You're not going to necessarily be able to see... Uh, on the camera that the the black is deeper but um, yeah it gives me a really nice controlled stroke I don't know where else I want to so um you're going to get your best result with the brush pen, but uh, or the brush, I should say, excuse me, the actual brush. But you have to be uh, a little patient with it. And this ink actually needs some, uh, needs to sort of be shaken and have some darkener added to it. I might come back to that. One time Iceberg got transformed into a whale. That was crazy. Wow, I don't remember that episode. Milos is here and he says, I only watched the 80s movie and the Sigma 6 show. Uh, yeah, and the only G.I. Joe I really know is the original uh, 80s show. I don't, I don't know the, uh, the other cartoon versions.
It's not food time, Milo. My cat's meowing like it's uh, time to be fed, but I know that it isn't. He's just being a weirdo. Or he might want attention. But I can't give that to him either because I'm giving my attention to this and to all of you. So he can just wait. <laughs> Those weird G.I. Joe stories made me think of Herbie the Fat Fury. That would have been a potential as a great film. That would have potential as a great film. That's from TARDIS Rider. Yeah, Herbie, Herbie the Fat Fury is a very strange comic book uh, that is nevertheless pretty awesome. Herbie's just this fat guy with a with a popsicle, and uh, things tend to go his way. And he's very ambivalent about it all. Gonna add some chest hair here because A shipwrecks pretty manly and B too many comic book characters are drawn with no body hair and it's kind of weird to me. It's like it's kind of, it's normal for dudes to have chest hair and arm hair. I don't know. There's a uh, hilarious parody of Shipwreck on the Venture Brothers cartoon called Ship Shape, where they really point out how bizarre G.I. Joe is in terms of like them all having code names and themes and stuff like that. I like it. Morgan Moore joins and says, The episode of G.I. Joe where Shipwreck's family melted freaked me out as a kid. Me too! Me too! That freaked me out so much as a kid. I was like, I don't know, that one like legit horrified me. When he comes out of the car wash or something and sees, uh, or no, wait, he saw a roadblock coming out of a car wash and he's like, how was it in there? And he goes, sure was toasty in there. And then he just melts, like his whole body melts. Oh, that was disturbing. I totally know. <laughs> uh, Chris, did people back in the day bully you for love of comics? No, no, I don't think so. But uh, on the other hand, I don't know. Was I, I never hit it. No, I don't think anyone ever gave me shit for liking comic books. No. <laughs> if manliness is determined by body hair, consider me Miles Davis. That's from Mike. <laughs> uh, he looks a little bit like Solid Snake or Sam Fisher. Uh, yeah, I could see that, but Shipwreck came before them. He looks like a member of the Village People. He, he legit does, uh, but that's because the Village People base their outfits off of the same sort of things. Like, one of them was... A sailor. So he sort of had the same uniform. Yeah. I used to have a, a t shirt that was uh, various G.I. Joe action figures forming the uh, YMCA shapes. And it was like 
spirit, they're Indian, and uh, shipwreck, they're sailor, I don't know, who else, but anyway. Danger Show says, would you consider drawing Ramiko Takahashi characters or do a comic tropes on her manga? I don't know who that is, to be honest. Um, I'd have to do quite a bit of research, because I don't know who that is. Huh. Mike says, I, I remember specifically in sixth grade being asked how old I was by a girl for reading Spider-Man. Sixth grade. Sixth grade. Eh. Yeah, I think that you'll still see uh, people that think that comics are uh, for kids, but less and less so. Um, everybody watches Walking Dead, so... Everybody knows about the Marvel movies. It's not as it's not as geeky as, as it was when I was a kid. It was definitely considered pretty geeky to be into comics, but I also don't really remember ever being made fun of for it. Instead, I would get bullied by people like while I was doing my paper route. They would just consider me, like, fair game while I was doing that. And it's like, God, there were so many groups of people, like, other older kids that would make fun of me for, for that. And it's like, dude, I'm just trying to make money. Like, I don't, I don't see what's embarrassing about that at all. <laughs> uh, I got beat up a few times, too, during the paper. Like, people would just, like, gang up on me. I remember one time I like a four football players from high school uh, ganged up on me and just started beating me up for no reason. I was just trying to do my job. Oh well. They're probably all rich and successful now. I appreciate your Fast and Furious stream. Dodge Challenger is a badass car, and those movies are a huge guilty pleasure of mine. Thanks, Software Agents Corp. They're a guilty pleasure of mine as well. Chris, if you could make a super strike force of Joes, who would who would re you recruit for a rescue mission, says Comic Book Guy. Uh, the entire team. Everybody has their own specialty, so I, I recruit all, like hundreds of them. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you own the entire series on Blu-ray. Oh, the Fast and the Furious movies. Yeah, I've thought about buying them, but I've never uh, pulled that trigger. But I, but I do like them. I think that they're very fun, and funny. <laughs> uh, my favorite is six. need a different pen for this. Jake also says that he appreciated the Fast and Furious drawing. Had me jonesing for a classic Fantastic F wait, uh, Fast and Furious revisit. That's cool. I'm glad that some people liked it. The heck? 
my junior mints got sort of melted. How'd that happen? Oh, they were out in the sun. Darn it. Oh well. Swedish fish it is. Oh, sorry, Jake Turlock, you said FF. And I was thinking Fast and Fierce still, but he clarifies. He's talking about my Final Fantasy drawing. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, Aldi says that he hoped that I was going to draw the 60s bat boat today. Well, if I had thought of it, I would have. I didn't think of it. The 60s bat boat. They they did have a great Batmobile. The rest of their vehicles seemed very like sort of slapdash, but it was a pretty cool Batmobile. They did a good job on that for the 60s show and movie. <clears throat> Danger Show says that Rumiko, Rum, Rumiko Takahashi is the lady famous for the creation of Ranma, One Half, and Inuyasha, prolific in Japan. Incidentally, it's never okay to physically assault anybody except for self-defense. Yeah, I agree. Hey, Chris, how does it feel that your generation is now dictating what pop culture is? Hmm. Starting to get old. I want to see more new ideas. But I'm on the, uh, I'm on the tail end. When they're, when they're adapting stuff like Power Rangers, that was after my time. But I do like all the Marvel movies. That that is actually a treat. Now that you mentioned that, yeah. Quiet, Milo. That's my cat. He's he thinks he's hungry. The thing is, I know he's not. I know he's not. He might be. He might just want to play with me. He's, he's a good guy. I like my cats. Anybody else out there like cats? I know most people are dog people, and I like dogs too, but I'm mostly a cat person. Uh, Mike asks, uh, what did I think of Legion on FX? It's pretty damn good. Like, surprisingly good. Uh... Yeah, definitely wasn't expecting something of that caliber. <clears throat> Not that it's like the most loyal thing, but that's okay. Like they 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 use the ideas and they they went in some really interesting directions. And uh, yeah, it's a strong recommend. Mm, Software Agents Corp says he likes the Lego Bat Boat. Yeah, me too. Um, was that was that on the? Uh... Trying to remember, I think I have the uh, '60s Batcave set. Is it, was it? Is it in in that one? I, I I don't remember. I think it was. Um. Okay. 
Sorry, I was uh, giving thought for a moment to light source. I need a thicker brush. <coughs> came across an interesting video on YouTube today. Um, it was the science behind carnival games. Um, and I'd never seen the channel before, so if you ask me what it's called, I, I'm not 100% sure. It might have been a guy named Mike Rober, but that's honestly a, a pure guess. So anyway, the point is, he went to look at all the different types of games that you see at every carnival. And first they just observed for an entire day like how many games were played and how frequently they were won. Then they figured out like how much the prizes cost. Then they figured out like, you know, which games were random chance versus skill. Uh, it was great. It was really interesting. They're like this is a game you cannot win. This is a game you can win if you've got a high degree of skill. Uh, it was a really good video. Yeah. So look for that. The Science of uh, Carnival Games. It's called something like that anyway. Really interesting. Got a song in my head right now. And I generally don't like uh, Kanye. It's not really my thing. But I do like a few of his songs, including uh, Power. I got that echoing in my head right now. It must be being used in a commercial or something, because it's, it's like, where would that have come from? Uh, hey. Uh, Anyway, it's what's in my head right now. <clears throat> Tardis Rider says, Thinking of G.I. Joe reminds me of being in the Philippines and being called Joe all the time. As in, you want to buy a watch, Joe? Huh. Interesting. Uh, hmm. Are you from the Philippines, or were you stationed there, or did you work there or something? Why were you in the uh, Philippines, and when? That sounds interesting. No one man should have all that power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. CSNG says, here's the link to the carnival video. Oh, is that the one that I was just talking about? Thanks. Yeah, so if anybody's curious about what I was talking about, it looks like CSNG. Uh, very helpfully looked it up and got the link for everyone. Thanks. I'm basically a guy that when I um, go to, you know, theme parks or visit the local carnival or something, I'm always tempted to play uh, various games and mostly I don't because I know that the odds are not in my favor but it was interesting to actually see the science behind that 
uh, and have that backed up with actual data. Um, the one I, I do like to play, never won, and I've never seen anybody else win, is there's a, a red star printed on a, a small piece of paper, regular paper, and you get a BB gun with a certain number of pellets. It's like air pressure. You get like 100 bolts, and you have to shoot out all the red of the star. <clears throat> no one ever does it. Because at first, you're, you're blasting holes through it. You're doing really well. But the paper becomes like flimsier. There's, there's less resistance by the end. So like you could hit the red right on and the paper will just sort of like flap. It won't like tear. It'll just sort of like resist. So, so there's always just like a notch of red left. There's always a notch of red. It's like impossible to do. CSNG says, I like Mark Rober's videos. One of them talked about how much pee is in a pool. It also turns out the chlorine smell is caused by its reaction with urine. Oh, wow. So I did have that name right, that Mark Rober was the name of the guy? Because this was the, the first time I've seen one of his videos, I guess. So that's new to me. Um, oh, that's, that is interesting. You're saying that the chlorine smell is caused by its reaction with urine. Because I grew up, uh, we had a pool in my backyard. And... Overall, I would say there was not a strong smell at all. But there always was a strong smell when you went to like a public pool for a birthday party. And I just always assumed it was the amount of chlorine. But if it's caused by the reaction with the urine, that actually makes more sense. Oh, gross. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Jake says, great. Now you ruined swimming for me. Hey. Think of, uh, in the ocean, how much fish pee there is in there. Plus, they make love in it. So, you know, the ocean isn't that clean either. <laughs> Has everybody seen the movie, um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Uh, there's a scene in it where Marcus from uh, the college is, uh, I don't know where they were, somewhere in the Middle East, and he's uh, looking for help or somebody that speaks English, and uh, somebody offers him water, and he goes, water? No, no, thank you. Fish make love in it. It's just like this quick line that's so easy to miss, but it has always cracked me up. Water? No, thank you. Fish make love in it. Chrissy's going to name her new metal band Fish P. Woo! <laughs> uh, Mike says, some people did add too much chlorine, though. You were supposed to use those strips to know the pH balance. And I've been to, I've seen way too many people just pour chlorine into the pool. No, I know. Um, like I said, I grew up, we, 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 at a certain point in my life, we had a pool and, uh, it was like one of my chores to take uh, responsibility for it. And yeah, I, I had like all these chemical kits. There were, there were pH strips, but we also had these things where you had to like um, take a sample of the water and like, just like with an eyedropper tool like this, you know, you dropped like a chemical in or something and then you would like match up its color against this chart that told you how much chlorine you were supposed to put in the pool. It was honestly quite a bit of work. Um, but you know, worth it for a clean pool that you could have a good time in. <laughs> I hope we're disturbing everybody with the, all this talk about pee in public pools. You know, it's, it's Halloween time. Um, everybody deserves a scare. I was worried not all of you watched my uh, 
Sergeant Spook and Hellboy and uh, Junji Ito videos. So here I am talking about pee in public pools. Oh, I've got an idea that would be helpful for me. Um, what was the first video of mine that you came across? Um, this will help me understand what people maybe were looking for or what was recommended to them. So if you can remember, tell me what the first video of mine was that you happened to say. Um, that would definitely just help me for sort of overall uh, research. I don't like to talk about myself at length, but that would definitely be something that would be useful to me to know. Jonah Jello joins and says, uh, looks nifty. Well, thank you. Ah, for Software Agents Corp, it was Chris Claremont. Okay. Um, Liefeld for Sigamix. Sure. These, I would expect that. It was either that or John Byrne. Okay. Yep. Those are some of my more popular ones. Len Wein. Len Wein, okay. Huh, I'm glad I did that one then. It's nice to have you, Mike. Um, no TARDIS rider, no screaming kids tonight. Jake Terlecki says Chris Claremont. Uh, yeah, Chris Claremont's run was great, but he also, you know, clearly has a distinctive writing style that includes, like, the same elements a, a bunch. That was That was fun for me to comment on. So I'd grown up with that. Okay. That's interesting. Thanks, everybody. I mean, I appreciate that. Oh, maybe Kirby for you, TARDIS writer? Okay. You know, I mean, this is part of why I try to do a variety of creators, because you don't know, like, you know, who out there is looking for what. But, um... Yeah, that's super, super helpful, guys I, and gals. I, I'm always curious, you know, where my viewers are coming from and what, they, what they're looking for. Helps me balance the content. Thank you, John Angelo. The, uh, the John Byrne one. Okay. Software Agents Corp says, When I got a chance to read Claremont's run in order... It occurred to me how much he's into Arthurian lore and swords and sorcery stuff. Yeah, like basically uh, English mythology. He's super into, no question. Keep doing what you're doing. It doesn't matter where we start. No, no, I, Mike, uh, my point isn't like that I care where anybody starts. I'm curious what is catching people's attention. This was my opportunity to sort of have a uh, 
an informal focus group of a bunch of people that have watched my videos so I could just sort of see if any um, names pop up more frequently than others and I can go oh maybe people are interested in a specific era or a specific style of video so it's uh, it's useful to me just to sort of have an understanding of, of where people came on and, and what they liked what you know it's it's just useful Wait, TARDIS Writer says, I think it's probably likely that I came across you as a YouTube recommendation based on watching comic trips. I've never heard of that. Huh. Comic trips. Okay. That's very close to my name. Uh, Johnny Jello says, who is this character you're inking? Um, Shipwreck. It's a G.I. Joe character. Just a sailor. Nothing fancy. Keith says that Frank Miller was his first. Oh, interesting. Okay. Brendan Sellers joins. He says, by the way, the name of the Sean Murphy comic you were talking about the other night is Joe the Barbarian. Yes. Joe the Barbarian. I really like that one. That, that was an interesting idea. And uh, yeah, I like that one a lot. Thank you. Joe the Barbarian. It's about a kid who uh, passes out. Um, because he's short of insulin and he starts, well, he's either hallucinating or maybe it's really happening, but he sort of meets all of his favorite um, sci-fi characters and his toys and stuff like that, and he has to travel through different realms, uh, and it represents him sort of struggling to get downstairs and get his insulin shot. So he's sort of using that as his... Uh, his motivation to keep going like he's got a real life journey just trying to struggle through the house because nobody else is there and then he uh, sort of mythologizes it in his head um, very cool story very cool comic trips is a channel with a couple who travel around the country visiting different comic shops oh my goodness that's such a great idea darn wow I've tried to um, I've tried to when I can include visits to different comic book stores in different areas and I've always wanted to be able to include as many as possible but I didn't realize that there was a whole channel that was already doing that in a way that kind of stinks for me because it takes away that the novelty of that aspect but uh, but I like the idea of it very very much. Um, I mean, I can't be traveling all the time, so. Let me, uh... I need to clean up a little bit of what's going on down here around the legs. Uh, there's a lot of pencil marks that are sort of getting in my way. Okay. Well. Hmm. There's supposed to be some foreshortening going on here. It's supposed to sort of be going out at an angle, but I sort of feel like the, the feet and stuff look a little small. Um, I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, 
Software Agents Corp says, Chris, by the way, I met Chris Claremont, and he's a pretty cool, humble dude. That's really nice to hear. Um, I don't, yeah, I've never met uh, Chris Claremont in person. I've met some other X-Men creators like Walt Simonson, Louise Simonson, Bill Sienkiewicz. Um, but I've never met um, Chris Claremont, so that's nice to hear. He's a big part of my comics journey growing up. So, so I, I don't know. I made a couple of mistakes here that I don't care for, but whatever. Uh, John Agello says, Your style here on Shipwreck reminds me of Michael Golden meets Matt Wagner. Wow. That's awesome. Um, oh, my God. Brendan Sellers just gave me a super chat, and he says, I've had a blast drawing to your live streams this month. In case I can't catch another one live, happy Halloween, Chris. Brendan, thank you so much. That is really kind of you. I appreciate it, and uh, it's exciting to hear that you've been drawing alongside. Uh, if you've got a link to any of your work, like whether it's on DeviantArt or Twitter or Instagram or something, please feel free to uh, share it in the chat. Um, that's exciting to hear that somebody else is drawing alongside. Thank you. Wow. I will uh I will put that donation towards the show. I can promise you that. Let's see. Uh Tardis Rider says, I answered earlier, but you missed it in the P Talk. Oh, you worked in Korea for 15 years and holidayed in the Philippines. Wow, that's a long time to have lived in Korea. Where in Korea? Um I've never visited, but I'd really like to. It looks like um yeah, I don't know. From from what I've seen, it looks quite beautiful. The major cities and all, anyway. <clears throat> Software Agents Corp says that uh, his mom thought that Chris Claremont was Stan Lee. Oh, he's one of those comic book fellows. Well, who is he? Uh, Stan Lee? But no, Stan didn't take too much credit, did he? <laughs> um, Milos says diversity in comics travels all the time because of his job. He happened to be in Charlottesville the day was ha the day the rally was happening. Happened to be, and he bought a Black Panther comic to piss off white nationalists. Hmm. Happened to be. I don't think anybody happened to be in Charlottesville the day of the uh, racist march. Uh, hmm. <laughs> oh, where am oh, I? Oh, I happen to have traveled all the way to this march. <laughs> what a coincidence. Keith Thomas asks me, ever read Etheric Mechanic by Warren Ellis? And Keith says that he also draws every night while the show is on. That's so exciting to hear. I, I love thinking that I'm drawing with other people. Brendan, Keith, this is this is great. Like I know a couple other people have told me they've drawn with it on too, but like that like makes me feel like I'm really not doing this alone. Like I'm, I'm in a bit of a community, uh, and that's more fun. Um, no, I haven't heard of that one, but I do generally like a lot of Warren Ellis. Um, but there's definitely like gaps in my, you know, Warren Ellis knowledge. So, uh, what's what's that one about? Um, I'm trying to think, like what my favorite Warren Ellis thing is. Miller says, oh, that the diversity in comics guy, his father lives near there, and it's the only city with a comic book shop. Yeah, but why was he traveling right then to visit his father? That's, I don't know. I've never actually watched uh, that channel, I don't think, but I've heard about it. I've heard that it's, I don't know. I shouldn't say. You know what? I haven't seen it. I won't comment. Uh, 
Mike says, I don't want to bash Liefeld. He was a big part of my childhood. Me too. Me too. Um, uh, you know, some people like really, really hate him. And I'm like, you know, yes, he, he makes mistakes in his drawing and it's, it's easy to sort of see that. But when you're younger, there's an energy to his work. There, there, there is. And we hadn't seen as much of it. It was, I don't know, like it, it was definitely something I, I really, really loved for, for a while at a certain time in my life. And then I sort of, you know, grew out of it. But I don't hate Liefeld. And I'm, I'm not into much of what he does, but, you know, more power to him. If he's got people that, that are enjoying his stuff, I... I don't have a big problem with that. Like, it's not for me, and I'll comment on what I don't like about it. But I don't hate the guy. They, I mean, that'd be pretty weird in a way too. Like to actually like hate someone that's just being an artist. I mean, unless they're like making a statement with their art, and I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he is, but I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, Brendan says, my buddy and I are working on a horror comic that we're self-publishing when it's finished. Our Instagram is, all right, hold on, I'm going to write it down since you uh, super chatted. Oh. Let's see, uh, Mind Invader Comics on Instagram. Mind Invader Comics Instagram. All right. Uh, I will check it out. He, uh, Brendan is doing inking and colors. Uh, well, that's that's very ambitious. Uh, it's uh, not easy stuff. I think that um, colorists, you know, have never had an easy job. But you know, thirty years ago. Um, it was, well, there weren't the digital tools, so what you did took longer, and you had to know really good color theory, because you were essentially, like, you know, finding foregrounds and middle grounds and backgrounds, and, like, you know, making it very obvious what was what. But you could, like, block out whole characters in a flat color and just be like, that's the foreground. These days, though, oh, my God, like, you have to make it look like a, a, a gorgeous painting. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Sigamig says, oh wait, uh, TARDIS Rider is saying goodnight from the Eastern time zone. Oh, well, thanks for staying with us so late. Appreciate it. Uh, Sigamig says, I saw the Image Comics documentary and I thought Liefeld was weird and funny. Uh, I mean, I think that's part of how he got where he is. He's a charming dude. <laughs> Being likable is a tremendous asset in this industry. Did anybody else happen to watch my pal Robert Kirkman on uh, Late Night with Seth Meyers last night? I thought he was really funny, and it's cool whenever he's out in public that other people can see that. Like, you know, yeah, Kirkman has made it in the comics industry with some cool ideas um, and and... You're like, oh, but, you know, I could come up with that idea, this, that, and the other. Well, first of all, he proved that he could do it without anybody's help because he self-published for a number of years, and he, and he made that work. But second, he's just a really nice, likable guy when you're talking with him. He's, like, very charming, and that's a big part of his success, I think, is how good he is at just making you feel like you're important when you're talking to him. It's amazing. It's, it's quite a talent. Oops, I missed a few things. Uh, Software Agents Corp says, a fantasy of mine is to write for Marvel or DC for a one-shot or a one-off story. How does one get involved in writing comics? 
It seems that people like Claremont and Miller get lucky with a character or characters nobody wants like X-Men and Daredevil and shape entire franchises. Well, I mean, you're, you're getting at two different things, uh, or, or more, really. You know, the first question is, how do you get involved in writing comics? I mean, you could either become successful in another field that involves writing, uh, novelists, journalists, etc. If you're tremendously successful there, Marvel is or DC is going to show an interest in, in working with you if you approach them. Uh, and after that, you have to... You have to pitch to them, uh, and they're not going to necessarily accept a lot of pitches because they get so many, you know, and you're competing with people that are already established in the field. Now, Marvel at least knows that they can count on these people professionally, like, oh, this person will turn in their work uh, in a timely manner. So you're, like, competing against that because you're an unknown quantity. You have to not just have a good idea. You have to show them that you're a person with a great idea, a person that's easy to work with, and that they can count on. And the way you prove something like that is probably by self-publishing and doing a bunch of independent work. They're not going to hire an unknown. It, it, it's unless you already know somebody, you know, and that's networking. But basically, you're going to have to self-publish something if you want to get noticed by Marvel or DC. That's, that's just all there is to it. Yeah, I can't think of any other way to uh, realistically do a one-shot or anything like that. Um, Mike says, I don't think being likable is mandatory. Alan Moore. I didn't say it was mandatory. I said it helps. It helps tremendously. And we don't know what Alan Moore was like when he was younger, do we? Not really. Anyway, I'm, uh, I think I'm going to shut this one now I think I've basically done what I can do with this a uh, few few areas I would have approached a little differently um, I think I would have uh, would have tried to figure out the foreshortening on the legs just a little more. you know what I, I think that the, this would look right if I could add a background to sort of show the um, you know the, the sort of foreshortening angle so I think I could make like make this more clear that this is not wrong because I don't think that this is wrong. I just don't think it looks quite right right now. So I think I could show that if I if I included a background with um, perspective, but um, I didn't do a great job on how I approached the, the the coloring on the glove or around this arm. So this this is my problem area. You know, it is what it is. Uh, it's too bad, but. Uh, Yeah, just can't get everything right. But I had fun chatting with everybody tonight. Uh, Brendan says that he uh, loves Dean White, especially when he colors John Romita Jr., no question. But as far as the older style of coloring, I think John Higgins did a great job on Watchmen. I think he's a master of working with flat colors. Yeah, I agree, because he knows color theory, and he knows what contrasts, and he knows how to make background versus foreground pop. I, I, I like that a lot. Um, yeah, Software Agents Corp says Jeff Lebb got into comics after the success of his Commando script. Exactly. Uh, anyway. Yeah, good talking to everybody. All right, I will uh, be back tomorrow night. Uh, I don't know what the prompt is yet, but we'll figure it out then. And uh, uh, this was this was a good, interesting chat. Thanks again to Brendan for the um, for the for that super chat. That I really appreciate that. Um, all right, everybody, keep reading comics.